Good morning. My name is Doug Rosen. I oversee Dentsu Media across the Americas, and I am so glad after three years not being here, being back at CES. It's good to see us all back here. Um, we have a really exciting, um, you know, 90 minutes. It'll be fast, a couple of different segments. What I wanted to start with was the importance of this notion of what's next and how in media, what's next is, is all around us. It's, it's where we, we watch, listen, love, learn. We cry, laugh, experience, protest, care all through media. Media is, is really where we, we are next. Um, and when we think about it at Dentsu, it's all about this realization and belief that what's next is, is built in media. And that's a perfect opportunity for why we are at CES. It's all about how we find what's next. We harness what's next, and we strive for what's next in, in everything we do. Now, we see three areas that are important and you'll hear Mike talk about this when we talk about innovation areas. Uh, the first is identity, that um, understanding people as people, not just as data points, as humans, as, as individuals. And, and we, we talk to them as people. We don't talk to them as um, you know, an impression, as a transaction, as a number. And I think that's really important and something that you continue to see through all the work we're doing around addressable solutions. The second area is this notion of context and the power of context, that when we understand context, we, we talk at the right moments in the right way with the right offer, message. Context is where we start to bring um, the message to life in media as well. And the third is the importance of attention. And I'm, I'm really excited. This is the fifth year of Dentsu's work in the attention economy. And we're going to spend a lot of time in the first half of this year with all of you uh, um, sharing some of the latest and, and best because attention is under assault. Um, and our job as marketers and advertisers is really how we connect with customers and, and think about that interaction with them and not interrupt. And how we, we rise our messages above just being clutter into this real cultural uh, connection with them. And that to me, if, if you bring these three things together, identity, context, and intention, it really opens up next paths to growth how we can help you grow, how we can help your customers grow, and that's really what we're here to do at CES. So uh, Travis Montague is the founder of Holler, the co-founder and CEO of Group Black, and then you just started a new company that you're prepping. Founder of Creator. Founder of Creator. Founder of Creator. Uh, talk a, a little bit about your background uh, before we get into it, and then also uh, what creator is. Yeah. So I'm a serial entrepreneur and kind of probably borderline crazy for starting all these difficulties. But um, so my, I've always in my career sat at the intersection of tech and media. So I started my first company when I was in college, um, raised my first uh, venture round when I was in college, built uh, Holler, a messaging tech company that I grew to 70 million users. 1.4 billion messages a day. Uh, and what was interesting about that experience for me, it gave me experience in AI, because we built powerful AI that lived in messaging environments. It gave me experience around content. And also, it created an opportunity for me to work with brands, right? And work with brands to be involved in part of private conversations at scale in a way that was meaningful with the right context and relevance, in a way that was helpful for consumers and not and not uh, interruptive. So that was where I got started. And then uh, in that journey, I met my two co-founders, uh, Bon and Bao, who was just here a second ago. He left to do a talk, um, who, serial marketer. Um, and also my other co-founder, Rich Lou Dennis, who backed me when I was in college. Um, and he bought Essence from Time, found, founder of Sundial Brands, and so, uh, sold that to Unilever. So. Um, you know, we, for me, I always believed in building businesses in context of my values, uh, whether it was ethical tech, whether what we're doing with group, group, at Group Black about driving inclusion um, and, and, and inclusion in many different ways. Inclusion is part of the conversation, but also economic inclusion as well. And so um, 
it's been a really great journey. And then most recently we launched Crater, uh, which is a creator network uh, where the next wave of culture is made and monetized. And uh, you know, Crater is a continuation of that journey. We did, we've been driving economic inclusion uh, for uh, black owned media. And now we believe that creators are a very important part of the experience in the landscape today but there is massive gaps with respect to their ability to, um, with respect to their experiences, with respect to inclusion economically and, 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 and making sure that they can run sustainable businesses. So we're starting our work there as well. So for us here, what is the difference between creators and influencers? Because I think that that's often a mis perception in some ways. So I'd love to hear your, your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I love the fact that you asked that question uh, because I think it's very important. So to put it simply, all influencers are creators, not all creators are influencers, right? And that's a very important distinction. Um, and actually, personally, I don't like to use influencer anymore. I said they're creators that are influential. Uh, and so that, the, the reason why there's that designation is because I fundamentally believe, well, like not fundamentally believe, there, it, it is how it is. Um, there's creators that are of different genres that help people achieve, that impact people in different ways. There's some creators that are influential, which from a marketer's perspective, they could drive awareness, right? And they could drive buzz and those things, right? There's other types of creators that are, um, well, I think micro creators that are not as, good at driving mass awareness, but they are, have mass credibility and they could drive lower funnel activity like purchase, yeah. right? And then there's other creators that are not in front of cameras at all, right? But they are exceptional storytellers and they could help educate and, and people rely on them to tell reliable stories across many different venues. And so when you look at why it's not just influencers, right? It's because there are so many different ways to partner with this group. Um, they, and, and what I found is that, you know, from a, mar from a brand and marketer perspective, they're probably one of the most underutilized tools in the kit today, uh, which we, uh, at, from, from a creator perspective, are helping brands tap into that, the power of creators at scale in a, in, in, in a more meaningful way. Especially when you think about the power of, of word of mouth and, you know, nothing is better than that type of advocacy and endorsement in terms of driving a conversion or uh, new customer acquisition when you think about it. We, um, we spent some time over the last couple of months talking about this notion of creators as a, as a new startup, as the next startup. Um, what does that mean for you when, when you think about, like, you know, innovation and, and tapping into, you know, creators as a kind of factor or push for you know, new thinking and, and, and innovative ways of marketing? Yeah, so, you know, we, actually this goes back to one of the core missions of Crater, why we started it. So at Crater, we, we, we started Crater to change the landscape for creators by unlocking more value for them than ever before. And the reason why we thought that was incredibly important is because of this core belief that creators are the new startups, yeah. right? So they are culture makers and they move the world forward every single day. They're sole proprietorships, they're businesses of one. And what we found, so we did a huge study um, and we found that creators, although they make a massive impact to society and arguably have been one of the, like, the content that's consumed by creators probably outstrips everything, right? But at the same time, they're not, they're, they don't receive the appropriate value for that impact that they create. And so what has resulted in that is being a creator, the business of being, creator, of, of being a creator, the career of being a creator is in most cases unsustainable, right? And so, you know, in, in, but that's changing now. And so when we say creators are the new startups, what we're seeing is a mass movement of creators being able to take their creativity and turn that into a sustainable career because now they're not, going, they're not only going to be uh, 
capable of only monetizing via maybe a, 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 a influencer promotion campaign here or there, but there's real businesses being built uh, driven by creators. And so that's, that's, gonna be, that's, that's kind of a really important thing to watch out for. That's the thing that I'm really excited about that's coming down the pipe is the, the, the creators becoming sustainable businesses. Because we found, and, and Sarah right here is the CEO creator, so she's been like, at the forefront of this. Um, you know, we, we did this massive study to understand what is the condition of creators. It was like a multi-month study. And what we found is that in the, cur in the current circumstances, this was probably like eight months, nine months ago, 91% of creators were experiencing burnout, 71% of them wanted to quit. The average creator was making less than $50,000 a year, and it was worse for uh, black creators, which was making 35% less than their counterparts. And so if you think about that, like uh, it, if you're trying to make your creativity your career, that's very challenging, right? Because it's lumpy, you don't know if you're gonna survive this month or not, and then ultimately in, many, in certain cases, uh, you're underval under, undervalued. But what's exciting about this now is that there's tons of new opportunities that are, are arising to work with creators in a more scaled way, in a more sustainable way, um, especially for brands. And that not only is going to create culture-moving ideas, make, make, bring culture-moving ideas to the world, but at the same time, it's going to create sustainable careers for those creators because they have more meaningful relationships with brands. So I'm really excited about 2023 for that reason. And I think that um, this, the industry here is going to be a big part in that, in that movement. Yeah, I was reading the other week that we're shifting from almost this notion of a gig economy into this notion of a creator economy and how it creates a sustainability for somebody to earn an actual living off of being a creator, whether we like it or not, um, in, in, in some ways. But it, it is how a lot of culture and a lot of influence is, is being generated. Well, you know, it's interesting that what you're talking about um, from gig economy to creator economy, it's kind of connected to the, uh, the, the anti-work trend, right? Where, you know, a lot of people, sit when they're like, oh, anti-work, 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 that doesn't mean people are, don't want to work anymore, right? They're just choosing to leverage, to leverage their skill sets in different ways. And so you're seeing a massive, massive growth worldwide. I think the latest stat I looked at was like the amount of creators in 2021 um, was 50 million creators worldwide, and that number is expected to grow to 400 million creators worldwide by 2026. And so that is a byproduct, and that was that's been the, the the pandemic taught people kind of that behavior to start. And so it's going to be interesting to see as more people, whether it's a full time gig or a side hustle, what that does for how we work as a society when people have like all of these different kind of ways of working and, 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 and earning. Yeah. What, what is the role, uh, you know, you and I have spent a lot of time talking about economic empowerment and the importance of that. What is the role in diversity, inclusion, when you think about then the new creator economy and, and how should brands think about that? There's been so much activity over the last couple of years, rightfully so, around diversifying media mixes to minority-owned entities like a group black, but now we need to go further into thinking about the message, the creator, all of that as well. How, how are you guys thinking about that push beyond just diverse media and diverse, to, to, to diverse creation? Yeah. So as a business like owner and, and entrepreneur, I have, I, like, I, I have a certain belief. I fundamentally believe that inclusion is the biggest business opportunity today, right? And let me give you an example. So if you look at, uh, economic, if you look at inclusion from a content perspective, and we look at things like Encanto and you know, Black Panther and, and uh, Bridgerton, all these things that are these massive hits, People, it's not shocking that that content did well. It's representative of society in different ways and it's authentic it's storytelling. When you look at some of the main kind of components of Web 3.0, one of those key components is economic inclusion of creators, right? As a part of it and the technology is helping to drive that or even what blockchain does and all of these different things. And so 
if you look at, we look at inclusion as a business model, right? And for us, uh, and when I think about the creator, like, like in whether it's the creator economy, whether it's anything else, if we build those businesses or brands or whatever to be focused on driving inclusion for everyone, then they will perform better. And it's because it's one, it's not limited, but two, it's it's these are the types of things that the the next generation of consumers are demanding to see. Yeah. Um, so. It's not only it's it's not only good for the world. We don't look at it, inclusion as just being good for the world, but we think we look at inclusion as being very productive and effective for the bottom line as well. So, how do you measure? What's the KPI on a, in, uh, on inclusion? Yeah. So you know, I, there's the, maybe we'll build that, but like yeah. the, the yeah, I mean, uh, right here first. Yeah. That's why we're here, right? Yeah. So um, you know, there's no measure, but there's examples, yeah. right? Like what? I mean, like, so the, some of those examples is what, like, when you look at, um, like, businesses that include me as an individual. So, like, when we look at, for, again, to the content examples, if you see, if, if we see people when there's authentic representation in content, that that content performs better and the world reacts better. And that results in more sales, more box office, more product purchases, more all of those things with respect to that. Um, and I, I continue to look at uh, like those examples as a as an indicator of well, how do we scale that across many different disciplines of what 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 we're doing? Another thing from a um, inclusion perspective that I, I've been really uh, pushing uh, a lot of the companies at Group Black and our collective to do is a lot of Black-owned media companies historically has been considered to be Black-targeted audiences only. Right, and just because you're black owned doesn't mean you have to be black targeted at the same at the same time. And so, how do we? And, and that's exceptionally important because then, if you don't, if you are, if you're narrowing your audiences like that, then your market opportunity is inherently limited. And so, it will be exceptionally hard for black owned media companies to scale. So, we need to change, make sure that the paradigm is changed as to what people think about with black owned media companies overall. So, that's a big body of our work. Uh, of what w what we've been doing, and you know, I talked in DigiDay about they're like you know people are like Travis, you're looking to acquire companies and things like that. Why it, you know they're general they they meet everyone, and I'm like precisely they they need to. Um, so that's really important uh, for that. And now I'll, I'll give another anecdote. So one of the the my other co-founder, uh, Rich Dennis, he built Sundial Brands, which he sold to Unilever, and it was the na largest natural beauty brand. Um, in the, in the country, uh, and it was that because of one simple reason. When he built the company, it was good for people with curly hair, right? And what, is not only black people have curly hair, right? And so when he bought, when he had his product and he went to the retailers, they only try to put it in the multicultural section of the aisle, right? Well, the multi set, what a lot of people don't realize is the multicultural section of the aisle used to be the colored section of the aisle. Right, and so therefore, if his product was in that part of the aisle, then it would be overlooked by a majority of the audiences because of placement. What happened here? He fought to get his product. His his products were always on the main shelf, and just by virtue of him challenging that system, it became the largest. Because Eureka, a lot of people have curly hair, and so it was. It, it's an example of if we. If we think about, if we're trying to drive a broader change in how these things are, are designed and built, we have to really rethink what, how are we, like when we think about economic empowerment, if we try to do that in the same paradigm of what it is today, then it's really hard to grow. Like I, probably a lot of folks in this room have tried to increase their spends with diverse owned media and, and, and players and they hit a wall very fast, right? Because they're like, oh, I don't have any inventory, et cetera, et cetera. We see that. And so from a group black perspective, we've been saying, okay, what is it that we needs to happen in the overall architecture of how th this landscape works so that we could change, drive that change that needs to happen? And that's the work that we've been doing. Yeah. First, I'd say I had curly hair once. <laughs> um, <laughs> but... Uh, um, 
I, I think one of the things around economic, and we, we've spent the last year and a half, I mean, if you think about uh, a lot of the clients here and the spend together, that, that we went from zero to a significant amount because of this notion of diversifying the mix. But there is this kind of challenge in a lot of the mechanics, a lot of the infrastructure. You've helped us kind of figure out some of the things that we need to unlock. Um, I think one of the most amazing elements is like the 30-day payment terms for uh, diverse and minority-owned uh, uh, media outlets and creators because and we heard one example of um, how this allowed somebody to get an air conditioner, Ooh. right? Like th basic things that we might take for granted as enterprises and large brands, the creators and diverse media outlets struggle to make capital to operate their business. Ooh. And I think like those type of infrastructure changes beyond just creating more minority owned inventory, more minority owned opportunities um, are really important as well. So, you know, it's the work, it's, it's, it's those specific things, right? It's the, it's when we started the work with Densu, it, the, it, from the first conversation Doug and I had, it was about, well, what is the, ch a real, sincerity around understanding the, the blockers that exist today. And so tackling things, everything from payment terms to measurement to, to all of these different things that are part of um, the things that causes that category, that causes compression in the category is something that is what true partners help you overcome, right? That example about payment terms is like so real, right? It's because, you know, if you're a person who is, and in, so a lot of people don't realize, and this is why Group Black had to invest as heavily as we did to build a lot of infrastructure. 1% of black-owned media companies have over 10 employees. So imagine trying to service, you know, more than one large client at the same time and build your business when you don't, you have less than 10 people, and it's probably like three or something like that, and you're not getting paid for months, right? And then you have to convince people to be, it's okay, right? And so, there's a lot there when you're trying. These are literally sole proprietorships and very small businesses, and so are creators, by the way. And so we had to rethink how we did it. And so when we built Group Black, we thought of ourselves as a platform, and we built we we built all that infrastructure that all of the companies at Group Black and all the creators at Crater will be able to take advantage of and focus on being creative, right? And good storytellers and content creators and us building that way. And then I have a t question for you, Doug. Yeah, what is it? Um, so, you know, one of the things I've, I've in, in my working with you guys last year, you know, I've experienced a, a, I mentioned that sincerity around doing the work. Let's call it just doing the work and yeah. understanding. What has been, the and it's unique, Right. What is the driver of what has been Densu's philosophy or driver of why this has risen to the top of the kind of agenda as one of the things that you guys are actively tackling? Well, I think um, there's probably three ways to look at that. First is a lot of our clients are asking for it. And I think that's most important to our thinking is to have that as core to what we do. We don't just do to do. Um, and it's really important to think about it in that way. I think the second is um, it's what consumers want. It's what consumers are looking for. It's how consumers are now thinking about brands and, and defining their definition of brand based on be it uh, inclusion, be it sustainability, and other factors that I think are new to us as marketers. Um, I think the last thing is, is more personal. Um, I have two teenage kids. Many of us have, have kids. I, I want to leave the world better for them myself. Um, and I want to go home. I want to come back from this proud of the real change that we're making, the meaningful progress we talk about. Um, I love Jackie Kelly, our, our CEO, says this is a race with no finish line. And I think we can apply that to everything. And 
I, I just feel we're not complacent in how we're looking at this, and I hope you all as, as our clients feel that and what we do as well, and, and the commitment like in building things like Mark Prince is in the back leading economic empowerment, Diva Bronson leading uh, brand assurance, which is you know uh, uh, sustainability and, and deliverability of ads. These are important elements that often don't get talked about you know, especially in, in environments like this. So, you know, our job is just to make those always front and center um, as we look at it. Well, we certainly appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, Travis, thank you. Uh, appreciate the partnership, appreciate your dedication. The last time we were here all together was 2020. Um, it's funny enough, we actually had this um, slide entitled it The Tipping Point, 2020, the year of the tipping point. And it was no prophetic, you know, thing about a global pandemic, but it was about how we look at technology. And every year we come to CES and we're like, cool, bigger screens, cool, um, auto is doing this, X, Y, and Z. So, you know, we pay attention to all these trends, but they're incremental changes every single year, right? Everything from the auto industry becoming more dependent on technology, um, becoming a living room on wheels, uh, democratic healthcare, right? Democratized healthcare in the tech sector. Um, you know, a lot of things with the screens, rolling screens, flipping screens, everything that we see every single year, incremental changes. And rarely do we get the opportunity to actually look back within the one year frame, but looking at a three year frame of where we were before we left. And, you know, shout out to Sarah who was able to make it to the floor yesterday. We saw some really cool things um, that really changed our mind on a lot of things that might have been you know, a frivolous invention three years ago and now coming into fruition, one of them being Sony's car, right? Um, I actually sat in, t sat in it in 2020 thinking it was like some sort of prototype concept and now they've announced their partnership with Honda. Um, they're not even talking about TVs, they're talking about VR, they're talking about their gaming sector, they're talking about their car. And Sarah and I are talking about, you know, is this a lean into their transmitted storytelling strategy now? We can go from gaming to other screens on the phone to to their TV as well, but also into the car. And so what is that strategy telling us? We see companies like Asus giving glasses-free 3D laptops, so now enhancing that experience of being able to do something in 3D and view something in 3D without actually having additional hardware, that notion of technology should be seamless and feel like magic, right? Uh, LG's transparent screen along that same thread. It's not in the room until you actually want it to be in the room. And we, we keep on seeing these technologies grow and grow over the years, and really, really interesting enough, Samsung home robots utilizing AI, you can actually tell this robot to say, hey, you forgot my room, or you forgot you know, to clean another corner of the table. It will start to process that and actually go and do that. So things are getting a lot smarter from three years ago. We've included a lot of things like health tech that address our new situation, the way that we work. Technology and work is a really big thing in the sector this year. Um, but we, we actually want to go into 2023 with some context. What are we looking into, right? Economic uncertainty, whether we believe that we're in a recession or not, um, we are going, it's going to have an impact on how our consumers behave, how they purchase, their brand loyalty, they stay with you versus something that's maybe more affordable or maybe something that's more luxurious because they, they, they can. That's going to have a huge impact on the way that we speak with them. Shifts in the social sphere. We, you know, Travis and Doug spoke about this earlier of how creators are really driving this, especially Gen Z is driving this, where we're looking at different ways to monetize. YouTube Shorts, for example, going after TikTok. They have 1.5 billion viewers every month. TikTok's 1 billion, right, overnight when they release Shorts. And it's because they have a really interesting model that pay the creators. So that economic empowerment for the creator, again, is going to help ship, shape, uh, shape shift the social sphere. Wow. Shape shift the social sphere. Not only that, we have uh, folks who own social platforms that might drive certain things a different way. We have politics involved, so there's a lot in policy involved, safety, privacy, regulation. All of this is gonna, is gonna be important for 2023. And then lastly, media everywhere. Something that we all know is really coming up. Retail media is huge. Streaming platforms now adding media. Um, ride sharing apps now adding media. Everything now has a media component, one opportunity for us to tell our story in completely different ways and across the board or two, a fragmentation where our consumers are gonna be really tired and kind of like frazzled by all this stuff. So opportunities as well as challenges ahead. So we have a few, four quick 
trends that we actually have deep dives on that we're going to be releasing throughout the year. The first quarter is going to be on generative AI and AR. The second quarter will be about other things. Um, so we're going to run through this. So apologies if you, if you have questions. Um, we'll, we'll get to that in the deep dive, so we're happy to do that later on, but strap in. So generative AI. AI has always been a hot topic of CES. Anything from Sophia the Robot in 2018, even before that, but Sophia the Robot is actually the first robot who became a citizen of Saudi Arabia. Interesting. Uh, we had self-driving vehicle concepts. Again, we talk about vehicles being more dependent on technology. What does mobility and the future mobility mean for us if we put a living room on wheels? Right? Um, emotional growth companions, 2021, Moxie released. Moxie helps children deal with emotional and societal um, intelligence, right? Empathy. These robots can talk to them, help them work through what they're struggling with. And they've had great results of putting this in front of children. Tech for good, I guess. And then you will see, you'll see kiosks, um, intelligent personas. So digitizing our experiences with people, giving them ways to be able to um, experience a personal touch without it actually having to be a person and how that scales out. All of these things, not to mention Alexa and Google Assistant being inside of every single device that you see on the floor uh, this week, right? And that's been going on for the past few years. So why 2022 or 2023? Are we talking about AI? Wow. Uh, well, 2022, Generative AI actually brought it to the masses, right? It was huge. Memification, speed, accuracy, all these things put AI on everybody's roadmap that weren't just you know, those who were in the betas or anything like that. It's funny when, when Sarah shared the list of the speakers that are gonna come up right after this. Alex right here, reported from the Information The Verge. Um, he and I were actually in a lot of clubhouse rooms early in 2020 when somebody actually had access to a chat GPT-3 early back and we're just geeking out. I was up till 3 a.m. just, hey, can you give it this prompt? Can you see what it says? Like, does it think it's gonna destroy the world? All of these things we're just nerding out at um, back in the day, met him in person just a few minutes ago. Um, but this is really, really interesting stuff where you have chat that has really, really interesting responses within seconds and then also text to image applications here. So what you see here is probably what you've seen before. Who hasn't heard of Dolly or Mid Journey or Stable Fusion? Um, essentially, you just write something like city on a pizza, and it puts city on a pizza. <laughs> Scientists discovering fire in black and white. Scientists, you know, all glass burger, right? All of these things. It, it's not taking and stitching together a Google search of like, okay, this is like a pizza, and then let's put that pizza there, and let's, let's take a city and put it. They've actually understood what a city is, what a pizza is, what city on a pizza could be. And so it's quite interesting to see the progress of how this will change so many things of how we create, how we communicate, how we create content. Again, Doug said it ourselves, we're moving into this creator economy where everything and everyone, I've got nieces and nephews who want their own YouTube channel at the age of seven, right? Crazy, but everybody wants to create content and this is an easy way to do so as well. They each have different recipes and how they actually synthesize what you're saying and they'll come up with different things. Like I spent hours and hours playing with these things. OpenAI ChatGPT released in December. Within five days, it hit one million users. It's the first application to ever do that. You know, sort of like a, a chart to show how Instagram and Spotify and Netflix, all those things, it's different. Like Netflix, you had to pay for Spotify. You know, it's, those are different comparisons, but I, I, I love when you stack it up to show the impact that it had. And again, that's due to the accuracy, the speed of it, the perceived accuracy, I should say. And the memification. Here's somebody asking ChatGPT to write a biblical verse in the style of King James Bible explaining how to remove a peanut butter sandwich from a VCR. <laughs> and it did it in like five to 10 seconds. You see it just thinking and writing and scrolling. I wish I had time to show you all a live demo because it is fascinating how fast it is. And we'll do that in the deep dive for sure. We're only at the beginning of how this will impact. Again, we will go this in the deep dive, but Anything, I use this, the, the first one I use this on, it's a widget that I have on, on my Chrome browser, and I hit a button, and it can give me an executive summary of any article I have, three key points, a counter argument to it within 10 seconds. I, it blows my mind. It also can help you write an essay, an email, a brief, um, anything like that. Um, I had Elvis sing Flow Ride is Low, Low, Low um, in this as well. It's, it's fascinating what you can do with this. And if you ask it how it can enhance your marketing flow, it'll answer. It answers what they can do for you and things that you should be looking at. It's crazy. This impacts the concepting of product development. It impacts ad creative 
perhaps, an ad decision creative. I just wrote a concept car for an electric SUV that's seat seven, that's family friendly, that's hyper realistic and off-roading and can be city, city driving capable. That's what it came up with in the 60 seconds. I asked, hey, do the same thing, but in downtown New York City. And that's what it came up with in 60 seconds. Fascinating stuff of how you can utilize this to create certain things. And we talk about this a lot. It's not going to take our jobs right now, right? We will get there. Um, but this is like this hybrid approach of being able to say, hey, can this impact what I'm doing? Can this, can this lighten my workflow? Can this inspire me to do X, Y, and Z? And then you still need a human who's versed in this space, all these brilliant marketers in here, to actually take that with a grain of salt and build on top of that. I asked it to write an original movie plot of marketing executives at CES where robots become sentient on the CES floor. And it wrote this, the tag is called Sentient Machines. The tagline is the ultimate technology becomes the ultimate threat. And it has a protagonist, Marcus Johnson, who struggles with PTSD and was an ex-military specialist, Ava Rodriguez, Elliot Shaw, the, the villain. And it had all these things and I said, well, give me a plot twist. Give me another plot twist. Give me a detailed description of what these people look like and their characteristics and what they value as a human. It wrote all of this stuff about the physical description, um, you know, Marcus is a tall, muscular man in his 30s with a black haircut, scar above his, his eyebrow. Ava is a petite woman in her 20s, sharp jaw, brilliant robotics physicist, right? All these things. So I put that into a completely different AI platform, and it came up with all of these people that could play these characters. Again, this, these were generated in minutes. However, it took me hours to just perfect it of like the prompt. You have to write everything in a very cer diff certain different way or it could spit out something completely different. So there's a lot of theories of a prompt engineer actually taking over creative jobs because you're sort of like writing to the AI in different sentence structures and different spacings and different qualifications to d dictate what you get, right? It, quite interesting, right? Um, Interesting stat here, AI is outpacing Moore's Law, which we know Moore's Law is about processing speeds doubling every 12 to 18 months. Um, it's doing that in every three months, and this was 2009 study by Stanford. It's 2023 now. So this is rapid, rapid adoption, rapid, rapid tech, and this is the type of tech that compounds over time, right? You're giving it feedback. It's generating its own data. But there are considerations of this, right? We talk about things like ethics and regulation. Is it ethical for an AI bot to scrape the internet? And you can tell it to draw me something in the style of Monet, and it can do that. In the style of anybody, you can do that. So is it stealing, or is it the same? The counter argument to that is, well, if I studied your artwork for you know, a whole year, I could probably do the same thing. So there's a lot of questions about that. But the implication from a brand, though, is if we're putting our brand stuff out there, our information, our creative, our strategies, is AI going to dissect that and then give that to one of our competitors? How do we make this a closed loop for us? Politicians want to have regulation around it as they should, perhaps. But there's already open source software on this um, that you can't, the Pandora's box is open. So good luck trying to do that. Um, there's something called the trolley test, which we've been talking about for many years, where if you're in an electric vehicle or self-driving vehicle, there's one person in the vehicle and there's three people in the middle of the road. Does it swerve and potentially injure the one person, or does it hit three people to save the person that it's in? So all these things will dictate training, bias. If you go back to this, so I showed this to somebody this morning. It's like, well, everybody looks white. Yeah, everybody looks white. It's the training data that it has. So this is a really big thing of training data for AI is extremely important to make sure you have diverse perspectives. I asked ChatGPT, are you biased and are you representative? It says, I'm not representative, I'm definitely biased. It depends on the training that you have and the feedback of the humans that are building me. So it's very aware, thank God. Weaponization, sorry for this image I created, but um, weaponization, who knows that for every, for every Superman there's a Lex Luthor, right? You can use it for good, every tool has good and bad. And then unintended consequences, we don't know what's gonna happen in the future. We don't know if we create super intelligent AI, which everybody says is the last human invention, is what's gonna happen. So take that. Um, so glimpses of powerful AI on the showroom floors, right? We, you can check all these out. It's really cool. Deep Brain did something to memorialize departed loved ones. So you can actually ask them questions, talk to them, impart those stories, and hear back from them. Um, that hits home for a lot of people. So if you um, have a box of tissues, go check it out. You actually, from a lighter note, you can have um, AI vision robots to be the perfect, you know, espresso coffee that you could have. Obviously, all the robots down there you know, implore you to go check them out, play with them. 
see how it is because this is going to definitely be a part of our future. I'm not going to say this this year, but something to pay attention to because we're seeing a lot of growth this year. All right, secondly, Web3's rebrand. Um, so we talk about the past couple of years being quite turbulent for the Web3 space, right? This is all of us, or many of us, talking about NFTs. We have a little trough, and then we kind of like, oh, I'm rich, I'm going to go buy a house, or instead I'm going to buy a, a pet rock. And then you decide to have all these things that are happening from Celsius and hacks and unscrupulous founders and owners of these platforms that kind of put this in the state of crypto being in this winter, right? Although volume is down, you know, we can all admit that when it's not going to go up crazy this year, we, we're going to stay in this winter, we're not saying it's going to go up, but the searches for self-custody wallets and education has gone up. The growth in smart contracts being deployed since last year has gone up. And the amount of global wallets has gone up. And that could be through custodial wallets, people just signing up for an email and a credit card, not necessarily actually going to like 10 steps of opening up a crypto wallet, right? So some glimpses of hope there. Moves and foundations still being made, right? China banned cryptocurrencies. Now it's like, hey, well, in, in January 1st, we're going to have our own digital asset. It's decentralized, right? I don't know. Um, and then you've got you know, Yuga Labs, who hired an executive from Activision Blizzard uh, because they want to build out their metaverse product. Um, Doodles, a big popular um, brand within the NFT space, hired an executive from Billboard because um, they want to become like the next Disney, and there's a lot of uh, overlap there. And they hired Pharrell as a chief brand officer, right? So these are all moves from these companies recognizing, hey, if I'm going to scale, I need to get larger mass recognition. And brands are doing the same thing. From Nike to our own team working with Starbucks, to Reddit on a platform, they're all changing the nomenclature of what they're, what they're doing and what they're saying. You go to the websites of Dot .swoosh, which is Nike's, um, Starbucks, Odyssey, or even Reddit, they don't talk about NFTs, they don't talk about blockchain, they don't talk about wallets or anything like that. They're digital collectibles. Reddit, for example, minted five million of them, and they've only been around for like six months. Five million, that, that technically makes them one of the largest um, NFT marketplaces, um, even more than OpenSea over six months, right? Because of the nomenclature, because they make it really easy to onboard people, which is the key things here to think about is how do you onboard the masses, right? No tech jargon. It's just imagine like how would your grandma or somebody or us, right, in this room do it? Um, building a utility, right? They're moving into like loyalty programs and benefits to co-collaborate with them and having, you know, benefits on their platform if you have this NFT slash collectible, not buy this really cool looking thing for you know, X thousands of dollars. It's you know, a few bucks and you put your email in your credit card, done. Mixed reality, getting closer to reality. This growth is being fueled by a few things, namely the advancement in web AR, cloud computing, edge computing, as well as you know, 5G for, for what that's worth. We've been like waiting on 5G for so many years now, um, but it's, it's progressing. Um, adoption has increased by 233% since we were last year in 2020. People are using AR without realizing they're using AR. Having a dancing hot dog in the middle of this, in the room, having a face filter, trying on clothes, shoes, anything like that. 233%. It went from 600 million to 1.4 billion this year. And then acquisitions in the space. Niantic, the, the creators of Pokemon Go, acquired a company, Eighth Wall, many of y'all know. They specialize in web AR, so when you actually put those together, you have a massive, massive opportunity to scale out AR experiences in a really interesting, immersive way. You have speculative releases from hardware. Many of these you can see on the floor. Um, some you cannot, but Apple coming out with their own. Rumored to be $3,000, so I'm not sure how scalable that will be. Um, interesting that they're putting the battery on the hip versus in the, in the goggle, right? Smart, right? It's less head fatigue, but it has just like a cord. I'm not sure if they're going to charge you for dongles or not. Um, <laughs> MetaQuest Pro 2, we've talked about that. Um, Niantic, again, creators of Pokemon Go and Snap. Dragon creating this, and then Snap, of course, one of the biggest and best AR platforms ever um, is creating their own, right? And so we're going to see these massive consumer brands and platforms get into the space to help scale this out. But startups actually at CS have been making inroads for many, many years, right? So you can check all of these out, Vuzix Ultralight, Arja Smart Glasses. Some of these are really purposely driven, where you have this one in the middle, for example, um, for people with impaired vision that has a 4K camera and it, and it actually puts it right in front of their eyes on the lenses. And so you actually can reclaim your lost vision with this. So doing the Lord's work in a beautiful way, very smart. Um, some of these have live transcriptions. Some of these you can watch video and have multiple screens to work. 
things like that. Really, really cool. So please try them on. Uh, tell us how you like them. Where does this lead us? More entertaining hangouts, future of work. Shout out to Microsoft for, for partnering with MetaQuest Pro 2 to do this. Education, shopping, discovery. This is all going to come into fruition at a much faster pace than we think since we were here last year in 2020 because of the technology, the adoption rate, and also the acquisitions in the space. So all of these signals really trigger this. And then lastly, accountability and sustainability. This is a really hot topic for many, many years, but if you've paid attention to any of the keynotes the past day, I guess this is officially day one, but we had you know, some key keynotes yesterday and then some today, most of the major brands actually kicked off with their commitment to sustainability. Most of them, right? They're all like, hey, we're doing this X, Y, and Z. Every, so many companies have a commitment 2050. Many have a more ambitious goal of 2030. Many are being accused of greenwashing, right? So you actually have to have accountability in what you're doing on the supply chain side, even on the media side. We have, we have products and we're working with companies that are actually having carbon neutral um, ad platforms and ad experiences. So talk to your teams about that. On the floor, you'll see everyday products help our carbon footprint. I love seeing this. Samsung created a washing machine to help reduce microplastics entering the ocean stream because it's doing this at this level. So really, really cool technology here. Goodyear, they have a 90% sustainable tire that actually outperforms the previous tire. So it's a win-win. And then you have Asus announcing a carbon neutral, the first carbon neutral laptop of 2023 uh, for, their, for their enterprise devices. So all of these things are pointing to, yes, we have this commitment. It'll take time. But again, if you were to say that in 2020 and come back in 2021, you're like, oh, hurry, like, hurry up. But this three-year gap, we've actually started to see progress. And that's, I think, when you zoom out, is really important to take a look when you get the floor of where we were in 2020 to where we are today. So we're talking about, obviously, key trends, to things to look out for on the floor from those who've actually been on the floor. But also, you know, you're in this day in, day out. Like, tell us what's going on. So we just had some amazing trends from Mike. Mike, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, AI feels like a big turning point right now. I feel like we've talked about AI as a trend at CES for a number of years, but I think for marketers, it feels like a nebulous concept. AI is gonna be a trend. What does that actually mean? I feel like we now actually have some really tangible ways that brands can start thinking about adding AI into their teams. Can you add a new AI person or a product or a tool into to what you're doing day to day? So kind of wanted to ask you first off, like of some of the trends you just saw from the presentation, which ones are you like, yep, double down, this is really big? And which trends do you think maybe challenge or something that we may have missed? What, what else do you think we should have our eye on? It's really interesting talking to you guys earlier and hearing Michael talk and uh, talk to a lot of other people about trend pieces for next year. We've all sort of landed on the same five things, which says we're either all completely right or we're all completely wrong. I think we're mostly right. <laughs> Uh, but definitely the AI stuff, the metaverse stuff. The AI thing, I think, is interesting because it's reached a tipping point where you can show a practical application for people. But right now, that practical application is your kid can cheat on his homework <laughs> by uh, you know, asking the question to ChatGBT and getting an answer that I showed to a teacher friend of mine. And she said, you know what? This is a B, B plus. And for most kids, that's fine. And it's right. so impressive. <laughs> But at the same time, it's a little bit like a magic trick. It looks great up front. When you look behind, you see the little sleight of hand with the cards, and you go, OK, it's just rearranging information it found online in slightly different ways and making it sound natural. There's not really a lot of actual thought there. And that's why, for now, it's a B paper. It's not an A paper. Yeah, I think if you uh, extrapolate the generative AI stuff out a little farther, we could actually see um, the return of Bing or at least like the rise of Bing this year, which I think maybe doesn't make sense right off the bat. Microsoft is the largest investor in OpenAI. What they're working with OpenAI to do is to integrate it into Bing. Uh, Google is working on the same thing, though what's interesting, I talked to a lot of, and as I'm sure Dan does, a lot of executives at the big tech companies. I was actually having a conversation with the CTO of a, of a mega cap uh, that does a lot of generative AI work uh, the other week. And he was saying, we have to be really careful as a huge company with billions of users to how we implement this AI because it's confidently wrong. So 
Um, and it's always looking back on data sets that may not be necessarily correct. So yeah, it's kind of lit the world on fire, especially with kids, because it's, it, it's exciting. It's exciting to be able to just type into a prompt and have something made out of nothing, or so it seems. But um, I think you're going to see a lot of hesitancy from the big guys uh, getting into this space because of that confidently wrong factor. Google had pretty much everything OpenAI is doing years ago. They've been working on this. They've just been kind of sitting on it and trying to figure out how do we roll this out in a responsible way. Yeah. That's a really good Please. point, and it makes me think about how people Google information and get bad information in those early results and just confidently lean in on that, or they say, oh, I saw a YouTube video about this. I did my research, and uh, this is just another avenue for people to be more wrong. God, that's great for misinformation and disinformation, everyone, as we as we move forward and see you. Um, so each year, people kind of complain when we get to see us, like, oh, it's nothing that different. It's, a, you know, it's a bigger TV. It's, you know, from 4K to 8K to 16K, whatever. Um, given that we have had a bit of a gap, um, do you, is there anything that has sort of had a bit of a surprising, like, step change in the couple of years that we haven't necessarily been talking about um, some things? And you're like, oh, this has actually crept up on us. This does feel new. Well, Michael didn't mention the $11,000 Alexa-powered toilet. <laughs> uh, there you go. I don't know if there's demos of Progress. that this year. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, yeah. This, Dan, do you have any thoughts? You know, not being here for two years, but being here every year before that, going back to about right. 2004, I went and walked the show floors. They were setting up stuff last night, and I was struck by actually how oddly almost conservative and traditional it felt. It was still the big TVs, the slightly smarter washing machine, uh, a lot of laptops with, uh, you know, small generation over generation improvements. I think that's because... Number one, consumers still want these things. They want the bigger, better TVs. But also, a lot of the stuff that we talked about in terms of trends, whether it's AI or sustainability or even metaverse, it's hard to show on a, uh, you know, on a table in front of an audience. They're things that are not quite as physical. So this show is always built around the physical, but the more interesting stuff we talk about is the not physical. So there's an odd sort of contrast to CES in that way. I don't know. There's also the Samsung oven with a live stream camera inside oh, yeah. it. That's pretty physical. That, that's on my list, man. Um, that's yeah. even my new monetization strategy is just yeah. live streaming whatever I'm cooking that I night. love the metaverse boost at CS because you go there and there's like nothing in there, right? It's just <laughs> like, because um, yeah, you're right. It's not really here yet. There are some interesting headsets. Um, there's a startup called Lynx that's probably one of the more interesting uh, startups, a crowdfunded startup, which is actually how Oculus started before Meta bought it doing a high-end mixed reality headset. Uh, Magic Leap is here, obviously. Um, so you can try some of these things, but I think Michael did a great job of kind of previewing what's coming and a lot of the best stuff. So the the, the next Consumer Quest headset's coming out uh, the back half of this year. That's gonna be a big moment uh, for VR. The initial, the, the last Quest has sold the same as Xbox uh, on an annual basis, so it's doing quite well. So I do think, I'm, I'm we have a, we're in a bit of a metaverse kind of trough of this was actually, I interviewed Mark Zuckerberg about this actually a couple months ago, and he used this phrase, which I thought was interesting. We're in this trough of disillusionment uh, about metaverse, which he's the guy who kind of <laughs> may be responsible for that. Um, but I actually am cautiously optimistic that, especially in the back half of this year with Apple coming out and with the Quest 3 coming out and some interesting startups like Lynx, we may see a bit of a, a renewed interest in the, in the space. Yeah, I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna stick with the M word here, the metaverse. So obviously that was a huge buzzword over the last couple of years, and it's it's moving from a sense of conceptual to kind of understanding it. Is it really here? Is it really a metaverse? Is it a multiverse? Let's be honest. Um, so something I was thinking about yesterday. Um, so Internet of Things devices have always been a really like key preview for CES. We've seen obviously some weird and wonderful devices, wearables, things for your home, and so forth. Um, but the thing that's really sort of held back, I think, sort of some of the excitement, particularly around the marketing community, around maybe using some of the data and so forth, has been the interoperability of some of these platforms. It's always been walled gardens and, and so forth. So this year, uh, well, last year, um, the, I guess, the use of Matter, which is, you know, a essentially Matter is a, I guess, a protocol, a language that will allow all of your Internet of Things devices to actually speak to each other finally. So rather than you having to dive deep into just one ecosystem and, and buying deep so all of your, you know, your smart lock and your light bulbs can talk to each other, they've now allowed for interoperability. So bear with me the very long way around to get to Metaverse. So Metaverse is meant to be around interoperability, yet the reality is 
walled gardens, large companies are not necessarily at this stage going to allow for that interoperability that will allow for uh, everyone playing nice together. Do you think we have anything to learn from what's happened with IoT around the fact they finally sort of got together and went, mm, we're probably halt we're shooting ourselves in the foot by not necessarily progressing here. Do we think there's a time frame around when we could potentially expect something like an interoperable metaverse, if ever? And do you think any initial player in the market currently could be that person that helps bridge the gap? Or would we expect there either to be a meeting of the minds or potentially a big third party to come in and solve that problem? You know, interoperability and standards, that's been a tech and consumer tech problem going back decades and decades. I don't think the metaverse is going to solve that because if Apple comes in and says, okay, now we're doing a headset, now everybody's excited about it, uh, there's no company that loves walled gardens more than Apple. So I can't see them, you know, breaking decades of tradition there. Uh, but also educating people on what this metaverse concept is and how it works, you know, was Second Life a metaverse? Is Roblox a metaverse? It's so amorphous that I think we're gonna have a hard time wrapping our heads around what we're actually selling using that term. And maybe after a year or two, we'll say, we're still going to do the same things, but we're going to have to come up with a new term because this one just didn't take off. Right. Yeah, I mean, interoperability will matter when, ki when kids, I say kids, you know, teens or whatever, are wearing headsets and going, oh, I can finally bring my Roblox skins into, or my Roblox stuff into Fortnite, right? That's, and I don't think that's actually going to happen with those two titles. I think we're probably five to ten years out of meaningful interoperability. And for the metaverse, honestly, matter at scale. You know, it's actually started to happen. That makes me think of, we have started to see some of that in cross-play in gaming, where some big games you can actually much more easily go Xbox to PlayStation to PC to mobile, and that used to be verboten. You could never do that, and now people are more open to that, so maybe there is a path forward. Yeah, and I think we're seeing, you know, the rise of free-to-play games, you know, the fact that there's a less snobbiness around, oh, you just have to be a PC player to be able to get in, and the fact that mobile players will really drive a number, a big scale across a number of what we'd consider AAA titles, I think is, is really interesting. Cool, so we did talk a bit about Web3 NFTs, uh, again, going through a turbulent time right now. Um, so I think what we're seeing is a bit of a market readjustment around you know, people maybe dabbling or what their strategy or rethinking maybe some of their strategies around maybe a pivot back to the technology versus what was a bit of a hype culture, uh, I think around it over the last couple of years. Again, in my historical look back on CES, I was like, well, VR kind of went through a similar thing, right? Like everyone got really pumped about VR and then it kind of fell off the face of the planet. Everyone was like, well, hang on a minute, I'm not gonna buy this for my home. Now we're starting to see devices that actually are affordable for people arguably to, to have in their home. So again, what do you think around what we're seeing around sort of, I guess the pullback of the crypto winter and you know, Web3 and NFT projects? And what do you think will kind of continue to sort of bubble along? And then what do you think the time frame is where we might get back to a, a stage where we feel a bit more comfortable around it? I just like seeing everyone sort of retconning their own opinions on this, going back <laughs> several years. Oh no, I never thought this was a great idea. Uh, <laughs> I, I think a lot of people are deleting old tweets right now. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really amazing that, you know, it, a lot of these tokens were just Ponzi schemes, right? And a lot, retail got the rug totally pulled. SPF is the personification of this. Um, that said, what you said, like the, the underlying tech, there's a lot of really smart, passionate people in Silicon Valley that I talk to and my colleagues talk to who are doing startups. A lot of capital got deployed by venture firms into crypto startups during the, the last uh, spring, crypto spring, whatever you want to call it. Um, those companies aren't going away. They're building. Um, I actually think we may see just a return of interesting stuff happening on Bitcoin, actually, instead of all these weird kind of side tokens and side chains uh, because of the truly kind of decentralized nature of it. And utility. So I cover social media. Um, there's a lot of really interesting stuff happening in decentralized social media, and that's kind of like a big, heady word. But basically, censorship resistance, these things, especially with Elon and Twitter, are becoming, I think, something that are, uh, it's, it's entering more of the mainstream, but outside of just like the early adopter crowd. And so uh, I actually think we could have a very interesting couple of years for decentralized social media. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to stick with the privacy and sustainability uh, piece as well. So obviously, these are hot topics as, you know, we have, I think that the positive around Web3 was that it really did start allowing us to think, well, hang on a minute, maybe our systems of sort of taking people's data and they're the product and, and so forth. It's, uh, it's allowing us to have some really meaty, interesting conversations, obviously, as a marketing community. Um, sustainability also is opening up the door to how do we create more sustainable, uh, healthier 
products, healthier business practices that really support, obviously, a healthier planet and so forth. So consumers are really checking read receipts on this. And obviously, younger consumers, you know, are, are naming and shaming people as well. Like, what are, your, what are your thoughts on how brands can sort of go into this in a meaningful, in a meaningful way? What do you think are some of the positives or watch outs that we should just be thinking about as we continue to focus on these? Um, and do you think there are any new, newer players or platforms um, that we should have our eye on that you think are interesting around, particularly around privacy, I think is probably an interesting one. Like, you know, we're seeing the rise of obviously platforms like Brave um, in terms of, you know, people who partner with, for anyone unfamiliar, Brave is a privacy focused browser um, software that doesn't actually collect data without users uh, specifically opting in for advertising um, and so forth. So. Yeah, any, any thoughts on any people that you currently speak to in market that, that you're excited about there? You know, I think that this has been an interesting year that we just finished where people became much more aware of a lot of the data that's being tracked on them because we have to answer that uh, cookie tracking question every time you go to a website. And as annoying as it is... And the Apple prompts. Oh, I yes, mean the, yes. Yeah. and that's actually been great. I don't know anyone who's opted in for any of that, but, but it's great that you can do that. Uh, I cringe when I see someone go to a website and then quickly click, click the accept button without, you know, you know, customizing their preferences. I go, what are you doing? That, that's like, it's like eating something somebody hands you without even looking at it. <laughs> uh, but I think it raises awareness, and I think that's uh, a positive sign. But, you know, we're, we're, I, I've been around a long time. I think younger people are less sensitive to this because they've grown up in this public sphere, and they're not as, as privacy sensitive as maybe people of my generation are. Yeah, I mean, Apple kind of unilaterally told the industry that uh, first party is the future, right? And especially on mobile. And now you're seeing the, the walled gardens get bigger, and the smaller guys have a harder time. Um, and so there's Shopify is a really interesting player in this space with what they're doing on the ad side, trying to get around that. Um, I think Apple may eventually have to kind of relent a little bit on how hard handed it's been with this uh, tracking transparency stuff, as they call it. Um, it's different when they do it, but when it's tracking when others do it. Um, so yeah, I think that's a very interesting, I'm sure on top of mind for a lot of people in this room is um, Apple kind of showed that one company can regulate the entire industry more than any actual regulator, which I think is just amazing. Right. Um, anything else on this floor that you're like pumped about? Any new areas? Any? New, I mean, a lot of people talk about CS kind of becoming like a new car show, really. Um, anything that you are, you know, excited about? New that you're that we we should be looking out for ourselves. So <laughs> Sony and Honda really called their EV brand Ophelia. Did you guys see this? I didn't see that. <laughs> that's an amazing name, Aphelia. 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 That's, that's what stood out to me so far. This is super in the weeds, but uh, Michael mentioned the Asus laptop with the glasses-free 3D auto stereoscopic. That's something that I reviewed some glasses-free 3D laptops, I think back in 2012 or 2013, and they didn't work very well, and nobody made them after the first generation. Now they've gone and added eye tracking from Toby and other companies that mm. sits below the screen. You can't really see it, but it's tracking your eye positioning. Some of the new VR headsets have this also, or are going to have this, and that actually makes 3D auto stereo, no glass 3D actually work. Uh, and I think that's potentially very interesting. The catch is to try to get it to work for more than one viewer at a time, because if you're watching it and yeah. I look over your shoulder, the image looks great to you, terrible to me. Right. But still, uh, when people think this is a great new thing, you know, they tried it 10 years ago and it didn't work. Now it's a little bit better. I'm really interested to see what happens going forward. Yeah. yeah, this seems like the year that all the other EV brands are decided we're all coming for Tesla at once. And uh, we're all going to spend a lot to reach consumers. We're going to actually start shipping. Um, and it's going to be a really interesting year because Elon's so distracted with Twitter. Uh, and Tesla's obviously having a hard time. Still, still a great product. But um, that's been really, it seems like the EV rush to really take on Tesla's happening this year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a quick one on the on your point around the, um, I think, like new formats around, you know, the eye tracking so forth. What I was reading yesterday was actually that um, some of the new content opportunities that come from some of these new data points include there is a potential horror game that was talking about the idea of um, when you're in headset and it can see if you're looking at something if you and it says don't blink and they can actually add your blinking as a trigger point of uh, horror and action into it. So again, as we as we continue to see new sensors, new ways and data points of all of these different technologies, think of the content and the creative that can be built around these brand new ways that we would never even previously think of trigger points, creative, how do we engage customers in, in really interesting ways. I mean, the way they discussed it was that there was 
I don't know, some sort of like mummified bodies or something. You blink and then they've moved and you're like, oh my God, what's going on? Like, it sounds terrifying, but you know, attention economy. That's great. Um, okay, we talked about the weirdness of the urinal puck that can obviously, um, you, can, you can use and it will track your uh, health data. That's probably the weirdest thing I've personally seen so far on, on the floor so far. Anything other weird things that you're like, sure, that's strange, but it's a thing. I mean, I like the uh, Sony's adaptive controller for, for gaming. Uh, Microsoft's had one for a while. It's okay, but this one seems much more interesting. It looks like a very unusual game controller for people who, do, who don't have uh, the motor functions to be able to use a traditional one, and I think that's super interesting, and I like to see gadgets that break out of the traditional forms yeah. like that. I think I'm just going to go with the $11,000 Alexa toilet. Perfect. Good. With that, a oh, round of applause, please, for our, our editors. Thank you.